Category Group Director, R&D Hygiene Home and Innovation Partnership at Reckitt. Thank you and good morning. I think uh, w when we talk Reckitt, I think a lot of people in the room, they might not know who we are. I think it's one of those companies as, as a name that w we may not have heard of, but I'm sure that you've used one of our products or even are using one of our products at a daily basis. And so Reckitt is a large uh, FMCG company and we got uh, strong positions in a, in a large number of, uh, of categories. So my name is Willem Rensink, and I'm, I'm uh, responsible for how we work with suppliers or innovation partnerships and, and build a pipeline, sort of a front-end innovation of new materials uh, and get them in our brands and deliver superior products to our customers and consumers. And so the, the, the categories we play in, you can see them here at, at the screen. And so from fabric ad additives, uh, lab care, surface disinfection, other dish, germ protection, ultimate wellness, and we got strong positions in those brands, number one, but you might recognize some of the other ones as well. And so we're, we're structured in three business units across hygiene, health, and nutrition. And nutrition is our, our infant nutrition business, uh, largely in the U.S. So we have a broad portfolio of, of brands. Uh, as an R&D function, we go across our three business units, but I'm, I'm going to be very hygiene-focused because that's sort of where I live. Um, so like, my, 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 like most big companies, uh, we have sustainability ambitions. And this is aligned with uh, the science-based targets initiative and that framework on how we measure and report on emissions. And this is all disclosed public data before. And this shifts always a little bit. I think this is uh, 23 data, but it, but it doesn't shift massive. And so we have two main targets, which, which is pretty much in line you know, when it came out with the, with the Paris Agreement and the one and a half degrees warming. So first, we've got 50% emissions targets against 2015 base by 2030, and then 50% reduction in virgin and plastic packaging, uh, virgin plastic packaging, and then by 2040, carbon neutral, which again, I think it's, it's very much aligned where, where a lot of large corporations like ourselves are. So when we look at our scope three emissions, and you can see it here in the, the lower panel of the chart, and you can see that about 35% is in our raw materials and 15% in packaging. And so that's where we see combined that's about 50%. And this is why we're so interested in new materials and this material transition, because that's where the large majority of our, our scope 3 emissions are. And of course, in manufacturing, logistics, retail, and there's other, there's other, th uh, other things. And what we mean with uh, direct consumer use, that's the carbon emissions related to actually using the product. And like if you have a liquid or electrical that you plug in, that requires energy, you know, to emanate the fragrance, and that energy is captured in the direct consumer use. And but nowadays, in this carbon footprint, for example, the temperature of the washing machine, that's not our emission anymore. And so that's, that's an important distinction, because we say if we lower, enable lowering the temperature of the washing machine, that doesn't go against our sort of carbon credit production. Uh, but I think this is why, you know, we have a focus on these raw materials and packaging because of those two drivers. So first, then, then how we look at, at, at what do we do? Huh? And I think all of us in the room, eventually, even if you're in B2B, you have to realize we work for consumer. And we work for delighting the consumer. And how do we do this? So this really starts with a lot of consumer insights. And I think that's important, even if you're in upstream material development, to understand really what's the job to be done, what's the consumer trying to accomplish. You have to listen to that customer. And I think there's this famous quote from, uh, from Henry Ford when he invented the car. He said, if I'd asked consumers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And that's why he invented the car. But if you really think about it, if you thought about the job to be done, and you want to get across town, or you want to move yourself faster, it's a great solution, the car. If you want to win a horse race, it's a terrible solution, the car, right? So job to be done is really about understanding what is consumer trying to accomplish, what are the drivers of liking, the drivers of drivers, what are the attributes that you're trying to deliver with that product for the consumer, and you really deliver a superior consumer. And I I'd encourage everyone really to think about, if, if, you, if you want to sell in this market, in the home care market, uh, understand a little bit of the drivers of the category, and the type of product, and the type of technologies, and the technical attributes of, of, of those technologies that go behind these products. And, and then the second piece is then how do we sort of structure the category? What we mean with category is, for example, laundry or dish or air care. And those are all categories that you deliver the products against, uh, against the job to be done for consumers. And then on top of that, of course, we, we build strong brands because the brand gives a promise, it gives trust, 
the trusted name and company performance eh, of, of, of the superior performance. So that's really how we structure our pipeline around this, this consumer centricity. So a little bit of history, eh, what we mean with this category development. It's actually LIFOL, and I think for the, the US people in the audience, they must know LIFOL. I think in Europe, so it's a little bit less known, although you may know it. Uh, but it was really invented in 1889 in Germany uh, on the back of, of cholera pandemic. And in 1918, it was the first surface disinfection uh, as a response to the, the Spanish flu. And so actually the LIFOL brand has become a very trusted, trusted brand standing for disinfection. And it, it's related to these outbreaks. Uh, and then this is be continuous. Last year we launched the first uh, air sanitizer uh, with this LIFOL air sanitizer. So the first product on the market that actually can sanitize the, the air. And, and then that, that's an example on how we sort of disrupt some of the categories, like air care. Uh, you bring this disinfection benefit, as well as expand the category of disinfection, now from surface to laundry to air. And so this is a little bit how we think about uh, category development, category disruption, on how we find new opportunities to expand them. So then, and I think it comes up quite a bit in the conference, like what do consumers feel about sustainability? Uh, and, and I'm going out on a limb here a little bit, but I think it's not too difficult to find some survey with some of this data, right? But I think this sort of rule of thumb data is like, yeah, majority of consumers, if you ask them, they probably say they're concerned about uh, sustainability. And I think this is this, uh, I mean, you can see here the reference, that is sort of a public study I would say about 80%, maybe it's 90%, but a large part of consumers is concerned about sustainability. But then what we like to talk about is the say-do gap between the intention and actually the, the uh, purchase action. Uh, so there's a large gap between consumers that say that they're interested versus that actually do. Uh, and so what we're interested in is, of course, that people are willing to pay. And you sort of see that, that, that going down, is that, yes, we say we're concerned, then what are we actually doing about it as a consumer, and then start the acting by purchasing more sustainable, and are we really making you know, some compromise? So there's a bit of a pyramid, and I think that's really how we should see it. So how do you move this consumer from being concerned to actually acting on it? And we can look in a little bit more detail and say, okay, then as a small number of consumers are really willing to make trade-offs on the leg, and I'm sure if you pull up hands, most people won't like cleaning. And so if you look at drivers of liking of a cleaning product, convenience, efficacy, is always number one. And so most people buy these products because they sort of don't want to compromise. They want to have it done quickly, they want to have it quickly, easily, so that performance is really important. And but on the other hand, there's this, this really conscious consumer that says, yes, I've done my research, this is important for me, and I'm looking for products that really have that eco-friendliness. And they're basically willing to make some trade-offs to say, yes, basic clean is good enough. You know, may, they might go with what we mean with tutorials, so it still has to smell nice, right? So if you've done your cleaning, that's why these products are fragrance, because if your cue of cleaning and, and satisfaction comes after that, that fragrance cue after you're done. And, and I think that there is, so there is a consumer that you can reach that really is willing to make that trade-off. Eh? And they typically serve by the green brands. As a company like Racket, we don't have green brands necessarily, and so we go more mainstream. So I think it's important if you think about, you know, if you're wanting to serve this market, yes, there's a consumer, but it's not the biggest part of the market. Eh? And I think that's, that's the, the, the thing to keep in mind. So it can be done, but mainstream is, is more about performance eh? and less about that trade-off towards, uh, you know, the, the green brands. And so this is how we embed. Uh, we, so we try to innovate uh, uh, with, uh, with sustainability in mind. And, and what we do with the sustainability index calculator, where you see an example here, is that every product we launch, we want to have it more sustainable uh, than the current product uh, that it replaces, or an older benchmark in the market, so if, if, it, if it's a new product. And what this is does, it drives more revenue for more sustainable products, it also makes it aware early on in the development, uh, development life cycle of the product what the overall carbon footprint of the product will be and how it can be improved. And then, as you can see, there are certain trade-offs that you can make between plastics, water, carbon, packaging, the overall uh, ingredients. And, and so that score 
adds up to a, to a sort of a total and, and it's, it's a little bit weighted. And you say, okay, that's what I want to make it better than what we have today. Uh, because a lot of product innovation in, in consumer goods is about renovation. Eh? It's the next generation. It's better than the previous one. And that should drive more sustainable products. And this is how we do it. But I, I think we also recognize that this is not enough. Eh? And I think this is, if you work in the sustainability space, I think it's always important that more sustainable doesn't mean you are sustainable. Eh? And that definition of what is sustainable is actually quite challenging eh? and, and, and how you actually define that. And so this will drive incremental improvements, which is very much aligned with the strategy that most FMCG companies have, where a lot of product is renovation. It's the new news and, and keeping consumers excited about the brand, keeping them with the brand, you know, adjust to their needs. So if we really want to make step change, then that I mentioned, you know, we have some, some, uh, uh, some targets, then it's a combination of approaches. And I think this is sort of a hypothetical life path I, I pulled together. So this, this does not necessarily represent a real ingredient, but it gives you a snapshot on how we're thinking about this, right? So what are the building blocks in a life path to sort of carbon reduction? Huh? And the first piece is, is the obvious one. It's the, uh, it's the process efficiency improvement of suppliers. Uh, of course, we use a lot of materials that come from, from the, the fossil-based uh, supply chain. But even there, we see a lot of movement with chemical suppliers in process efficiency. Some are deploying CCS, uh, more, more modern assets, more renewable energy uh, that they use in their process. So, so we do see a big chunk. And you can look this up. This is public information that most big chemical companies, they will have targets on their scope one and two. And their scope one and two is our scope three. So that's, that's why we work very closely with suppliers to understand that. And then I think the second block is then, okay, how do we move away from some of these fossil, fossil feedstock and, and get more uh, renewable carbon embedded? Eh? And I think Michael from the Renewable Carbon Institute, I think he has this nice charge that what qualifies as renewable carbon? And so that's a big block. So how can you find alternative raw materials? Then I think this is one of the reasons we are here. So we do see that as an important lever and say, how can we move from sort of our current set of ingredients that we use to alternatives uh, that have a higher renewable carbon in there. Uh, but there's also products that are already made from renewable carbon, so that this block will be relatively small and you have to look for other ways. Uh, the third block, I think, and that's the most R&D heavy, is what we call mass efficient chemistry. And so how can we design better products that can deliver that performance with less raw material? Uh, and I think with catalysis, you know, you can save on your carbonate uh, in, in your bleaching system. With enzymes, you typically can save on surfactants. So by really, and by the right combination of surfactants and solvents, you can actually find products that use less active chemistry but still deliver. And I think this is always the highest on, on, on the top of how you make a product more sustainable if you use less active raw materials to deliver that. And then finally, I think if you really think about net zero, then it's like, there's no such thing as a carbon-free world. I think we need carbon. We need carbon for these, these molecules and materials and products. And so somehow you, st you have to build some offset scheme in there. And I don't know how big it is or what's the right offset scheme. But in the end, because you need the carbon to get there. And I think mass balancing, especially in the chemical industry, is one that's used where you sort of more or less indirectly replace uh, your, your raw material base with something that's more sustainable or has a lower carbon footprint. And so this really drives sort of the levers that we see on how you might get to your target. And every box we have different activities to say, okay, how do we, how does that contribute and, and roll up? And I think there's one, um, one important thing to note is that if we think about carbon, carbon footprint of raw materials, as a combination of that emission and embedded carbon. So the rule of thumb what, that we use is sort of this 40-60. It's different for different raw materials. Right? So, some are a bit higher, but I think as a rule of thumb, it, it holds up quite well. And so on the one hand, you have the process energy, and the other one, you have the embedded carbon. And I think it's important to sort of keep both in mind as, as you look at, at your product. Uh, because even the bio-based materials, they still might have very energy-intensive processes. And, and I think this is sort of my point I was trying to make. I was looking at our portfolio. I was, uh, I was thinking about this, uh, this talk. And I say, it's like, actually, we use a lot of bio-based materials. Yeah? 
so the soap noodles they made out of out of palm oil uh, eventually as, as a raw material. Huh? And I don't want to go in palm oil because it's a whole different discussion. Huh? But we use a lot of ethanol, we use a lot of titrate, paper packaging, a lot of fragrance materials, the natural raw materials, and of course milk powder. Huh? And for us, actually, these raw materials, uh, if you look at our overall scope for your mission, it's actually a lot because we use a lot. Huh? So they might be very good, but the volumes that we use are so big that these are actually very high. So I think you should keep in mind that just because it's bio-based doesn't mean it's low carbon, right? And I think that gets back to the, the point I made on the previous slide, that there's process energy and there's embedded carbon. So on the one hand, you might be doing really good, but on the other hand, there's, there might be a lot to be improved. Okay? And we see this, for example, in the ethanol industry, but there's also a lot of effort going on to make it more sustainable and, and even better from a, from a carbon footprint perspective. So you have to look at it. But I think the reason, and why I brought these examples up, it's really to show that if it's the right product, at the right performance, at the right price point, it can make its way in this section. Huh? It's not like everything is fossil-based, uh, because these are significant volumes that go into these products, and they are bio-based. Uh, and I think this is, this is sort of where I want to get at, that it's like, yes, you can incorporate uh, raw materials that, that are bio-based uh, or have a lower carbon footprint, uh, but I think it falls into two buckets. So if you come with a, a chemical-identical bio-based ingredient, yes, we do better on carbon footprint, but we don't see this, this improvement in performance. Uh, and then this higher on cost is challenging. And I think in the previous panel you can see if the brand can support it, sort of that green credential, and it's actually an enabler, it, it drives that premiumization, you might be able to accept that on cost. Uh, but if you look at bio-based ingredients that really drive performance, you have an improved carbon footprint, you drive superior performance, and you can justify that higher cost in premiumization of the product itself because it's a better product. And I think that's really where we should focus on it. You can understand the application, you understand what drives performance in that application, you can do really material innovation around it, drive that performance, and then you can, it, it's a lot easier to justify that premium for the product because I think it's been measured at this forum before, but don't expect this new value chain to be cost competitive right away. And then this is, this is one of the ways to get there. I'm not saying it's easy, uh, but if that, if that performance is really a driver of innovation, a driver of sustainability, then you can premiumize products, uh, and then you become the mainstream. You shift from that consumer that's willing to compromise to mainstream because you're delivering the, the product attributes and performance that consumer is looking for. And then just to wrap up, a few products that, that, that we've recently launched in the market and that shows some of these principles. So if you look at the latest generation of, of a monodose dishwashing tablet, uh, it's now down to 14 grams. The hard press staff that you had, or it may still be using, but it went from 23 to 14 grams. Uh, our latest generation of, of uh, a fresh medic, the other spray from, from Airwick, is propellant free. Uh, it's a mechanical, uh, mechanical mechanism, actually, that presses it. And the fragrance is very much based on water and ethanol. Uh, and our latest generation of Vanish, it uses a better catalyst uh, that allows lower, uh, lower energy, uh, lower temperature wash, as well as less raw materials because of the chemistry. Uh, and, and then we're also playing with, with retail solutions, of course, that, that saves at the, uh, uh, at the packaging. Uh, so, so to wrap up, the key takeaway, uh, that sort of sustainability should drive superior products. And sustainability and superiority are intrinsically linked. And in the end, that's how you deliver the, uh, the consumer preferred solution if you want to win in the market.